my pleasure to introduce John Clubness. He is a BHA board member and also quite the expert on our topic this evening, logging. He's a native of Superior, raised by Norwegian immigrants, and he has firsthand experience of old style logging in Norway with his grandfather. He spent his career in the forest products industry, uh, working at the USDA, the Forest Service, as well as the Forest Products Laboratory, uh, researching sustainable advances in paper production, like recycling um, and energy saving. So we are, it's our pleasure to have John here to share his program with us. Okay, here we go. Um, <clears throat> first of all, can you hear me? I have a, tend to have a weak voice. If you can't hear me, tell me and I'll speak louder. <clears throat> the title of my talk is Bayfield's Role in the Westward March of Logging. Um, <clears throat> the roadmap is, uh, is, is this, this talk is divided into three parts. The first is, a, is an overview uh, it shows the march of logging all the way from the East Coast all the way to Pacific Northwest. Mm -hmm. And um, the second part is, is Wisconsin's role. Wisconsin played a huge role in logging, in the, in the, in the logging uh, uh, industry. And the third part is, is Bayfield's role. And, um, and Bayfield, of course, Bayfield Peninsula uh, played a big role too. And <clears throat> I didn't just think up all these things. I, I, uh, I got a lot, I'd say 90% of the stuff I, I'm giving came from BHA. And uh, the first part uh, was like, textbooks that were available. And uh, that just sort of gave a, a good overview. And I just took, took parts, took uh, some slides from there. Uh, the second part um, was about Wisconsin and Bill Gover had really helped me. He had some beautiful pictures from the Wisconsin Historical Society, black and whites, very authentic, very old, and uh, just, just beautiful pictures. So that's a big part of the second part. And finally, the guy that helped me the most of all is the chairman of our little uh, lecture committee. There are six of us, and, and Bob Nelson is the chair of that. And he helped me all the way through, and especially the third part, he was, He's, he's written a book called Timberlands, and uh, here it is. Here's the book. And there's still some copies left. And, if you, and I haven't, he gave me his slides to use, which was, which was very nice. The book contains an awful lot more than I was able, I didn't have time to, uh, to get it all in. But uh, if you're interested in that topic and this region, uh, that, that's just a wonderful, wonderful book. So, Everybody on the committee helped me. I don't know if anybody here in the audience would like to be, give, a, give a talk like this, but uh, if you do, this is a tremendous place to get your material, and the committee, the lecture committee, um, is just uh, unbelievably helpful. Okay, the logging frontier. Of course, you know, what is, what is the logging frontier? Well, that's, of course, simple. It's the boundary between the logged and the unlogged. And it was the first frontier and perhaps the most important frontier. Well, there's a lot of frontiers, um, but this was the first and probably the most important. The, the people, the United States needed wood. They needed wood for everything, for buildings, for fences, for tools, for transporting building wagons, for fuel, anything that needed heat, you'd use, you'd use wood. Because before the railroad, you didn't have coal. And if you get a, a history of the United States, the historians often overlook the importance of that, this frontier. They might have a page or a paragraph, but it was hugely important in our development. And I hope to uh, tell you more about that. Um, here you see they have the Plymouth uh, Plantation. This is where, uh, east where Plymouth Rock is. And it, it's, a, it's a historical society, just like we are. They're supported by donations and grants. And the docents get a salary and they dress up in the old clothes and they talk in the old fashioned way that they did back in like 1669 or something like that. And, um, and here you see another picture, but look at everything is wood. 
The houses are wood, the fences are wood, the roofs are wood. They use wood for everything. And the person that first articulated the importance of the frontier was Frederick Jackson Turner. He was born in Portage, and his parents sent him to Johns Hopkins University out east, and he, came, he got a PhD in uh, history, and he came back to teach as a professor at the University of Wisconsin down in Madison. And he claimed, you know, that not only uh, was the frontier very important in, in the U.S. history, but he said that the, that the logging frontier was the, was the reason behind the development of American democracy. It came out of the American forest and it gained new strength each time it touched new frontiers. There were so many frontiers. You know, there was not only um, the, the logging frontier, but the railroad frontier and farming frontier, Indian frontier. And he had another uh, hypothesis that he brought forth that, um, that was never given much um, um, notoriety, but was not very famous. But he said the different ethno-cultural groups had distinct settlement patterns, and this was revealed in the politics, the economics, and the society that they, that they, that they uh, in the area where they settled. Uh, and so I would say that uh, the frontier, well, people formed the frontier. They were the adventurous people. Uh, they were healthy, and uh, and the frontier formed the people. So it was a two-way street. Uh, you couldn't help but being optimistic. If things didn't go right, you go 100 miles west. You could reinvent yourself. So I would say that uh, the people that the frontier formed were very um, cheerful and very energetic. I say, and that you know kind of created uh, the U.S. Uh, sort of character. And so the type of forest I'm going to be talking about are, are softwood evergreen forests, especially white pine. They were plentiful. They floated. That was very necessary because the story of logging is the story of transportation, really. And there was no railroads before the 1850s. Uh, the rivers were the earliest method. They, it was a winter operation. They used snow for sleds in the, in the spring. They would use the, use the rivers to transport transport the logs. Lumberjacks, they were um, a hardy group of people. They would, get, they would sign a contract over $100 a season all winter long, sun up to sundown. I guess they'd get Sunday off to wash their clothes maybe. But they started out in the East Coast and there were a lot of Yankees, English people, then Irish and French, and then as we moved westward, a lot more North European people. In the East Coast, Maine, Maine was the dominant state until about the 1850s. Bangor, Maine was a real big logging center. But the coastal regions started to become depleted, and then New York and Pennsylvania became dominant. And here you see a map, and you're going to see three more maps. Every 20 years, I'm going to show you how these circles, these, the size of the circle is relative to the amount of, of logs that were cut. And so you see it's moving away from from Maine, up in the right-hand corner there, and it's moving towards New York and Pennsylvania. And you also see Michigan and Wisconsin. This is back in, in 1869. <clears throat> um, in the upper Midwest, some workers came from the east, but now northern Europeans became more, more common. And here you see in 1889, you see uh, Michigan is huge. It includes the Upper Peninsula, and Wisconsin is the next biggest, and Minnesota. And you see the state of Washington and Oregon starting to get bigger. Chicago was really important. The huge tonnages were shipped to Chicago. They, didn't, they just used a fraction of it in Chicago, and most of it was shipped out uh, and to prairie cities like St. Louis, et cetera. And then the prairies and, and to the farms in the prairies, they needed that for, for buildings, et cetera. And then finally, when it gets to the Northwest, we use many of the same techniques. They didn't have snow in the winter, not many logging rivers. Uh, they had huge trees. But the one thing that they did that we never did is they replanted after clear cutting. So there's a real difference in the forest out there in the Pacific Northwest. And I don't know how you feel about clear cutting, but they always replanted. We should have done the same. And here you see, this is uh, the last one. No, no, it's not the last one. This is 1909, 
um, you see what the state of Washington getting bigger and, and the Midwest, Wisconsin, um, Minnesota, and, and Michigan starting to get a little bit smaller. And there's a lot of logging down south, but I'm not going to go into that southern yellow pine and stuff like that. I'm going to stick with the, with the northern tier. Um, so when they were out west, out in the Pacific Northwest, they had some piece, species of trees that were much larger than white pine. They had cedar and redwoods. And so they'd make these skid roads, and they'd lay uh, logs crosswise and grease them. And then they had these steam engines, these donkey engines, that would pull them with cables. And, and they, they were able to use the railroad a lot sooner because in the 1850s, the railroad started to catch up, and they were able to use the railroad much sooner out there. So here you see in 1929, this is the last one I show. You see the state of Washington and Oregon are huge. Wisconsin, Michigan, and Minnesota are starting to get smaller. Okay, that ends sort of the overview of the westward march of logging. And now we get into Wisconsin. Wisconsin played a huge role, really big role. And Frederick Weyerhaeuser, he was the, he was the Andrew Carnegie of the forest industry. He was, he, he became tremendously rich and uh, he played a huge part in developing and, and, and the forest products industry or the logging industry in Wisconsin. And then I'm going to talk about Ezra Cornell who founded uh, Cornell University out east and, and too bad he didn't found it in, in Wisconsin. That would have been good, but I'll, I'll get into the details about that. And then I'm going to see, show you a series of pictures of logging in Wisconsin. They're just beautiful pictures. They really are. And then I'm going to talk about the Forest Products Laboratory where I worked. And one of the biggest products of the Forest Products Laboratory is Aldo Leopold. He quit because they didn't make him director. He wanted to be director. He went to the university. And it was, uh, it was just a, a very lucky thing because he became uh, a, a very well-known author. Okay, Frederick Weyerhaeuser. He was born in Germany. Uh, he was born in 1834. Uh, he died in 1914. When he died, he's still on the record books all time. He's the eighth richest man, U.S. Per person. Uh, he, in today's dollars, he died worth $85 billion. Imagine that, a lot of money. Um, Weyerhaeuser Company is still the world's largest seller of timber. He's still, still going strong. He was, uh, Frederick Weyerhaeuser was born in Germany. He was one of 11 children. They had a 15-acre farm. His father died when he was 12. I imagine he learned how to work. How his work ethic was just wonderful. Um, he immigrated to the U.S. At, when he was 17 years old and finally ended up in 1856 in Rock Island, Illinois. And that's where he's buried. <clears throat> uh, he worked for a sawmill and uh, he purchased... Uh, uh, he, he, he was such a good worker, he became in charge of a satellite sawmill. And finally, um, the, the parent company went bankrupt, and he had saved enough money, so he bought the whole company at a reduced price. And in 1872, he established the Mississippi River Log and Boom Company. And that was very, very important. The Log and Boom Companies, they sorted the logs and, um, and then paid the loggers according to how they were marked, and then would sell them downstream to the sawmills. It was a, that was a key pinch point, and, and Weyerhaeuser realized that. Weyerhaeuser was a very smart man, very organized man, and up to that point, uh, logging was just sort of like chaotic. And here are some uh, logging marks. Uh, if you look down here, R.D. Pike, that's, uh, that's our own uh, R.D. Pike the sawmill that we have here. And um, I have to tell you, I'm just digressing a little bit, but... When I was 14 years old, I spent my freshman year, my freshman winter year in Norway, where I got to log with my grandfather, and he had a horse, and he had, there was a river there, he had a little tiny farm, but he had a fairly big forest, and that was where he got his cash. <clears throat> and I was never told this, but we, it was very important to, to mark the logs. And his mark was a cloverleaf, it was three zeros, and my grandfather's name was Oscar Olason. Ostagen, three zeros. His father's name was Olaf Olason Ostagen. And my grandfather's son 
my uncle, was named Olaf Oskarsson Ostagen, and then his son was the same as his father. But what they used to do in those days, they, the farms were so small you couldn't break them up. You, you, there's a, maybe you had 20 acres. You couldn't break them up. So it would go to the oldest son, and the other children might get something. It always caused a lot of bad feelings, but that's, that's the way they did it. And um, Okay, so <laughs> here it shows the, uh, the Chippewa River, just where it meets the Mississippi. And they had a big, uh, we call the Beef Slow there, the, the, the Log and Boom Company. And, and Weyerhaeuser got control of that. And then when it was open, uh, it was open for navigation. But when they closed the, the, the sheer boom, it would go over into some sort of swampy area where they would collect the logs and sort them. And um, Weyerhaeuser knew that uh, if he could get, if he could get control of these, these uh, sorting these, these uh, boom companies, he could become very rich. So he started investing in other boom companies. And they, the boom companies, you know, they were independent guys, small guys. And they knew that Weyerhaeuser had bought into him, but they didn't, what they didn't know is that he bought into everybody. And so he had influence, you know, he had to get on their boards and influence them. The loggers upstream, they didn't want that, this to happen at all. They didn't want Weyerhaeuser to control it because he would control how much he paid for the logs. And he could also control what the price was that he would get downstream. And that's exactly what he did. Um, Beef Slow became the largest lumber center in the US. Um, control of that slow uh, was a control of the white pine market. And eventually, Weyerhaeuser controlled the entire Mississippi Valley lumber market. He had control of it. He could set the price he was going to pay. He could set the price he was going to, he was going to sell for. So he became very wealthy. So in 1891, Weyerhaeuser moves to St. Paul. He's made a lot of money. And he lives next door to James J. Hill. Quite a lucky thing. Um, James J. Hill, you know, he started the Great Northern, went from Superior all the way out to uh, Seattle. And James J. Hill said, oh, you know, the Pacific Northwest, you should go out there. It's the land of the future. And so in 1900, uh, Weyerhaeuser bought 900,000 acres at $6 an acre. It was one of the biggest single land purchases uh, in the U.S. history. And he became, Weyerhaeuser became the largest holder of timber in the state. And uh, he, uh, but the big thing that he did was he replanted after cutting he realized that you could not destroy the resource base for a lumber company. You, could, you just couldn't, couldn't just cut all the trees and not do anything about it. And here you see a picture out in Seattle, out in the Seattle area. It's going from St. Helens to, uh, to Longview. Uh, St. Helens, they, they have a tree farm there, and it was started out in, in 1900, 1910. And, um, and this was taken about 1950 or 1960. And the trees were probably 50 years old. And usually by this time, they would go, but the most efficient way would be go by truck. But this, you see here, they're using a train because the terrain is so bad. This trestle is maybe 1,000 feet long and 300 feet high, but it's made out of, you guessed it, pine, you know. And so, um, and the next person I'm going to talk about is Ezra Cornell. Uh, he was born in 1807. He died in 1874. He was born, I think, in Brooklyn someplace. But he established an early telegraph company which became Western Union. And he um, uh, worked his way up, and, and, but he retired fairly young. Uh, he wanted to do something with his money. He wanted to do, he, he, re, he had $2 million in shares. And at that time, that was a lot of money. And so he spent the rest of his life as a philanthropist and he wanted to do something good. And he thought to himself, if the average American is going, kid is going to amount to anything, they need a better education. And the education that they're getting at that time was not very practical. You just learn things, memorize things, and then spit them back for the tests. And, and, and that was not really very practical. And here's a picture of Ezra. Nice looking guy, friendly, you know. <laughs> anyway, he partnered with Andrew White. And Andrew White was a professor who had graduated at Yale University. And they were quite different people. Cornell didn't have an education. Andrew White was extremely well educated, but they both had the same 
thought that the ed US education had to be more practical. So they decided that what they wanted was some type of education that would have the mechanical arts and, and have like agriculture courses and engineering courses as, long as, as, as well as the typical uh, liberal arts. So um, they started Cornell University, and then they had a big fight about who they wanted it to be a land-grant university, and so did other universities out there, but they won. They, they got it designated there. And the Morrill Land-Grant Act of 1862, this was a, a, a senator from, from Connecticut, uh, and Lincoln signed it in 1862, and it said in there the states without substantial federal land could claim land in states with surplus land. So they applied in Wisconsin and they got a million acres. They got a million acres. It's just wonderful. Um, and here you see a map on, up on top is Ashland and down here is, uh, is the beef slow down by Wabasha where, where, where the Chippewa River goes into the Mississippi. And the crosshatched uh, areas there, the, the crosshatched areas that are um, up and down uh, is is the oh, let's see up and down is what was given to Cornell and the crossways of Wisconsin Central Railroad, but you can see the land was it was just perfect it was it just they had their transportation just full of white pine, and um, Cornell was a good businessman he managed it for a while until he got the right price and then he sold off the lands five million dollars he got five million dollars. And that was an endowment for Cornell University, and it was unprecedented for its time. It was just an unusual thing. And they did adopt that type of curriculum for their students. And every university, all the land-grant universities, Texas, A&M, Wisconsin, Michigan, they all sort of copied them. So that money that was, that was taken from, from, from our forests here in Wisconsin did did result in, in, in good use. It, was, it, it really sort of revolutionized our, our university system, which is still arguably the best in the world. And so now I'm going to talk about the logging camps. Um, usually uh, there, was, there was a shanty, a cook shanty, a cook shack, a blacksmith shop, a barn, and maybe there's some other outbuildings, but it usually had these four. And here you see a logging crew, and, and these uh, in any logging camp, they might have more. They'd have more than one crew, and it would start out with the, with the, uh, what was it? The, uh, they had the first. It was uh, the cruiser. He would lay out the areas to be cut, and then the rest of them would follow. And they all had their jobs. Some would saw, some some would uh, haul the things. But and they, uh, it was like a golf team. They wanted to be the best. They wanted to be more productive than the other crews. You know, so the companies would sort of play that off against each other. They really didn't need to. They just had a sort of a natural uh, wanting to work, you know. Um, the loggers were uneducated. They're very self-reliant. They had farms in the summertime. They were strong. They were shrewd, multi-talented. They were carpenters, blacksmiths. And the amazing thing is that they worked together. You would think they wouldn't, but they did. They worked very well together. And here you have the cookies, the cook's assistants. Uh, they're getting ready to, to call the men in and big, big feed, of course. And here they all are sitting silently. It's a big thing about the dining hall, you know. They didn't talk. And my father, when he came from Norway, he worked for a little while up in, in two harbors, and he, it was a small logging camp there. And he had three sons, you know, and he would tell us, he'd say, you know, when I worked in a logging camp, you three kids make more noise than the whole logging camp made. <laughs> I thought it was a story. I just thought he made it up to keep us quiet, keep us from fighting and shouting and, you know, making too much noise. But it really wasn't that. I've heard so many stories that said there was no talking. And they, they've given three reasons, and they're probably all right. They said no talking because otherwise they'd get into fistfights. You know, they want that. That wasn't very productive. And the cooks needed to hear to keep, keep the food coming. Do we need more potatoes? We need more meatballs? And so they couldn't hear if the people were talking. But the third thing, I think the biggest thing, is the men were probably too hungry to talk, and they just wolfed their food down. That's what I, so they're all three probably right. But anyway, so with the railroads, you know, the railroads started coming up in the 1850s, and they brought hobos. And the hobos, one thing they liked was food. 
And the one thing that the lumber camps had was food. But they, you know, the hobos didn't want to work and the lumberjacks, they wanted them to work. So it was, sometimes they'd turn them down, they wouldn't feed them. But they were afraid because the hobos then, it would retaliate, they'd burn the woods down or they'd burn the cook shack down or something, they'd, they'd get back. So it was ticklish, you know, you didn't want to give away the food because they never worked, but, but at the same time you didn't want to have your house burned down or your woods burned down. Um, and here you see a very nice cozy bunkhouse, really, really cozy. Look at there, the, cook, the cook's assistant is shaving this guy, they got a warm, uh, nice warm wood stove and they got clothes hanging up in the rafters and oh, they're just probably telling stories and having a good time. No, it wasn't that way. It was drafty. They had shanks, the window was, wind was just blowing through these things. They had wet socks hanging up, stinking to heck. Tobacco smoke, wood smoke. They ate a lot of baked beans. You can imagine what that did, you know. It was a horrible place. And here you see the, uh, the carpenter shop and the blacksmith shop. And the, and the lumberjacks, they were, they were uh, responsible to keep their axes sharp, their, keep their horse shod, horses shod, and, and, and to keep, you know, the saws, saw blades sharp. sharp. And um, so they, that was a very useful place. And then on Sunday, they had Sunday off and they would wash their clothes. And I imagine, and they used to, they were made out of wool and they would boil them to get rid of the bugs, you know, the lice and everything. Well, what happens when you boil wool? It shrinks. And so you see these guys here, they're wringing these things out, they're stretching them. If they didn't, they wouldn't be able to get into them, you know. But that's the big thing on Sunday. Um, they were healthy. They, had, they weren't allowed to drink, but there was always some whiskey because if you got sick, you could have a drink of whiskey. They had patent medicines, Epsom salts for aches and pains. They didn't like taking baths, so they had invented this story that if you took too many baths, it was unhealthy, you know. So anyway, so then on, I suppose, Saturday night, they had a, usually had a fiddler. They would have dances, you know, women. Of course, the guys that were supposed to take the women's part, they would tie a bandana around their arm, and, and they would have these little barn dances. So they, they had a lot of fun, too, I guess. So now we're going to get into the part where they're doing the logging. They would cut these logs, and, um, and it's something I didn't realize. They used to cut trees with axes, all the way up to 1880. They didn't use crosscut saws. I thought they'd been around forever. But and one thing that they did, and I didn't, they would gird the trees so that the teeth wouldn't get caught in the bark. And here you see two guys using a crosscut saw by hand. But it wasn't until 1880 that they, they started doing that. And here you see the fallers. They're trimming the trees, trim, trimming the leg, leaves, and marking, marking the logs with their brand, you know. And here they have seen uh, a, a, a sort of a, a truss or whatever you call it, uh, loading the sleds in the wintertime. And here they're showing off for the camera. They never had loads that big. They couldn't, you know, that would be impossible. Um, but, you know, they're going to take a picture. They're going to show what we can, you know, we can build a load up really big. Um, I talked about this before. They had excellent work ethic, and, and the logging companies... Uh, would always recognize somehow that the that the best you know best crew, and here you see um, a water tank, and they would what they would do is they would fill this thing with water and ice the or wet down the uh, the, the road the ice road the snow road uh, the night before, and uh, and then next morning it would be very icy so they, the horses wouldn't have to pull so hard. And here you see them coming, but they when they had to go downgrade they would have these these. Uh, what they called hay monkeys or something like that. They would either put uh, sawdust or, or, or branches to slow the load down. And that's more typical load which they would have, you know. But they didn't want that to tip over because it could hurt the horses and a lot of work to repile the, the sled. And then they would have all these logs sorted, marked, waiting by the side of the river for spring to come. And then they would load it into the river. And the river was high. It could take... You know, the tremendous, I think this is a, this might be the, I'm not sure, with the Chippewa River, I guess. Um, and here you see driving the logs down river. Just look at it. Just look at what they had. And this is a five-mile log jam on the St. Croix, and you, you can see depict some men there. And uh, I happened to see a log jam near my grandfather's farm. Was, there was a falls there. 
and my uncle was one of the drivers. <clears throat> and they were just sitting there. Norwegians are very good at being quiet, and these guys were just quietly smoking their pipes, not sinking, drinking coffee. Not saying much, but finally they decided the one log was the key log. And so what they did, they put a dynamite charge on that key log, and they covered it with branches, and they lit it off, and a little explosion, nothing happened. So I said to my uncle, I said, looks like nothing happened. And he just said one word, one Norwegian word, he says, venta, that means wait. Slowly it started, and then creaking, creaking, and then pretty soon, slowly, started going back down. But they knew, they knew, they knew that they knew that which log it was, and it was just like pickup sticks, you know, millions of them. And here you have the log driving crew, and you see they're in boats. Their job was to keep the um, the river clear, and the boats had you know pointed at both ends so they could maneuver, they could back up, and and they would lower these guys down, and maybe they would s saw the key log, but a lot of times they would dynamite it. And so this is cold and wet and dangerous. Uh, here they're going down the uh, uh, Wolf River, down the Dells or the Falls. You know, see them going this and uh, daredevil guys, you know. <clears throat> and here you have the log boom, where they would sort the logs and according to the to the mark, you know, and then they would pay the loggers according to how many how many logs they got. But those loggers said, "We sent a lot more logs down there than you paid for us," you know. And, and the boom guys would say, "Well, you know." Uh, we get a stray log in here and there, it's just too much bother, we just take it and, you know, it's like cattle out west. If one of your cows gets into my ranch, we're going we're gonna to keep it, you know. So they would have wars and the loggers would come and dynamite the thing to go down to the next boom, uh, boom company, thinking maybe they would get credit for it down there. Here they see them sorting the logs. <clears throat> and then they would have, uh, this is a log raft on, on the Mississippi River. Um, and here is the, uh, here's these guys, they would work 12 hour days and they get like a dollar and a half a day. But that was to keep the logs going up into the sawmill. And usually they had these big circular saws. This picture here is a picture of a, of a band saw, which was not as popular as, as the big disc saw. And uh, here you see these, they would get these cribs and they would uh, chain them together to make a raft. And here it is going down uh, Wisconsin Dells. And these guys, the, the raft men had to be really, really skillful uh, to handle that big, uh, big raft and, and going through the rapids, et cetera. You can imagine how dangerous it was. And then if you get hung up on a sandbar, then the river men would have to come and pry it off and get into the water, get wet. Um, so it was a really kind of a hard life. And here you see, you know, the cutover land in Chippewa County. And it was a good thing in certain places because it cleared the land for agriculture. But up here, you know, our land wasn't that good. It was thin. Weather was cold. Not much of a growing season. So we could have, you know, replanted. We should have. We never thought of it. They didn't. But a lot of the stuff became nice farms down, down the middle of the state. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about the forest product laboratory where I, was, I spent 36 years working there. Gifford Pinchot was the head chief of the Forest Service, and he selected Madison as the site in 1910. And uh, here it was the first location. It's, the, it's a mechanical engineering building now. But um, in 1931, I think it was, they built the Forest Products Laboratory, and, uh, and that's the first building. And it uh, looks to me, I saw it was a little bit Frank Lloyd Wrightish. And there's like five or six buildings as big as that, if not bigger there now. But um, that was where we, we first started that. And the United States was the first country to have a forest products laboratory. And since then, any country that's had an, any type of forest has had a forest products laboratory. And you know, this has always been solely supported by the government. Other countries are in combination with, uh, with private paper companies or logging companies, they have a joint Thing, but we've always chose to go it alone. And I think people like Scandinavia benefit from, 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 from the sort of joint ventures. <clears throat> anyway, so the early research was wood preservation, for example. Railroad ties used to last, you know, the red oak or white oak, they'd last 10 years. And so they started a little project in 1910. And then at the 50th anniversary, uh, when, when the logs were 
railroad ties were, 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 were 50 years old, they were just starting to go. So they increased them by 500%. So a lot of logs were going in, hardwood logs were going in for railroad ties. So they, and then drying lumber. If you look at some of these houses out in the prairies or even around here, you see they're, they're warped. the wood is warped. They were, they were in a hurry. They, they built with green wood. And, and so they did a lot of research on drying lumber, uh, what type of lumber, uh, how fast you should dry it, et cetera, et cetera. They did a lot of, uh, the big diameter trees had gone, so they, they, they did a lot of research in developing things like particle board, strand board, et cetera. And these were just panels made out of scrap, really. And, um, and then they developed a waterproof plywood, which is basically make, developing a, a, a waterproof adhesive. One thing they did when the computers came, they got this best opening face, and the sawmills could just, when they were cutting logs right away, they would know uh, how to cut it, where to put the two by four, with one, one by 10 or whatever, and they would c reduce a lot of waste that way. Um, so that was some of the things that, that the laboratory were, were pioneers in. And Aldo Leopold, um, he, was, uh, he hi was hired in 1924 as an assistant director. He was a very smart guy, very, uh, um, a very hardworking guy, and he was very ambitious, you know, and he, he uh, authored uh, hundreds of technical publications, and I think he learned the craft. I think he developed a command of the English language. He published so many technical articles, and later when he did the Sand County Almanac, you, you could see that he was an accomplished writer. But he left because he was passed over for director. And as they like in the, in the late 30s, he was passed over, so he went next door to the university, he got, became a U, UW professor, but he had summers off to work on projects, which was really good. Aldo Leopold might have been one of the best products of the Forest Products Laboratory because um, he, uh, Aldo Leopold purchased 80 acres along the Wisconsin River. It had been once forested, had been logged off, overgrazed by cows, left barren. He bought it for taxes back in the 30s. He restored it. There was a little cabin there, chicken coop. He restored it, made a cabin out of it. He replanted pines where appropriate and he restored the prairie. The, the lands that should have been prairies, and and he uh, and he published a Sand County Almanac. He had published dozens of technical pub publications at FBO, but you can't find them today. They're out of print. They're up in the attic someplace. Nobody knows where they are. But the Sand County Almanac has never ever been out of print. Over two million copies have been sold, and he really was slightly like the father of the land ethic. And he said there should be three things consider when you're, you're dealing with, with land, with the forest. You should make them beautiful. I have no argument with that. Sustainable, I would say cost effective, but he used the word sustainable. And he said it should be ethical. And what does that mean? Well, I would say environmentally friendly, you know, not, not cause, you know, erosion or anything like that. But anyway, so that ends the, the middle part. Now we go to the third part that uh, that's really based on um, Bob Nelson's book. And here you see the peninsula, and you see the triangles there. They're, these are uh, uh, logging camps and the, and the filled in triangles. These are, these are uh, sawmills. And this, this is, this is uh, uh, from 1856 to 1958. And then the railroads, uh, from 1887 to 1930. You see the main line railroad going up to Bayfield, and then you see all these narrow gauge logging railroads, and you see the one a little bit north of Bayfield going into Red Cliff, and then you see further down in Washburn, they've got a lot of these little logging railroads, and you have some going over to Herb Herbshire, Port Wayne. Um, so, uh, and the people didn't want to believe it but there was people there that knew that we were going to run out of wood. And this was from a, a technical journal. I think it was uh, um, Northwestern Lumberman or something. But then they gave for the state Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, Minnesota, and they estimated how much white, white pine was standing. And you hear here like 1.8 billion, 35 billion, 41 billion board feet, 8.1 billion, nearly 100 billion billion board feet, but they were cutting it over seven billion per year. 
so it couldn't last forever. And people looked at that and they said, that can't be right. We'll never run out of it. We'll never run out. It could, couldn't possibly run out. Of course, we did. Um, and this is the, uh, in Wisconsin, uh, the log cut in the winter of 1881-82. Uh, you can see Lake Superior country. That's this our area. There's 186 million board feet. Now, the circumference of the globe at the equator is 131 million feet. So just that one winter in, the, in our country up here, up in this area here, we cut more, a, 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 piece, a, law, a, a piece of lumber, one inch thick, one foot wide, circled the globe just in one winter. Imagine that. That was, and then we weren't the biggest, we weren't the smallest, but there was, you know, for example, Mississippi Valley above the St. Croix, there's nearly a billion there, 952 million. So we cut a heck of a lot of wood. And here is for the winter of 1887-88. Uh, this is uh, in, in the Bayfield County Press. Uh, you can see Pikes Bay. They had Siskiwet, Pikes Bay again, Sand River, Pikes Bay, Sioux River, Sioux River. Township 40, that was out in the peninsula. R.D. Pike was a big one, 25 million board feet. And then, et cetera, you can see all these things. Iron River to the Montreal River, you know, 666 million board feet. In Washburn, they had 25, they had two mills reported. I think one was down that winter. One was 25 million, the other one was 23 million. And, and uh, so the total was, you know, a third of a billion, a third of a billion board feet, and there's an awful lot of wood, just in that one winter. And here is the town of Bayfield Hillside Camp. Uh, you can see the bunkhouse and the, et cetera, the, the dining hall. This is from 1870. Uh, they're using oxen to get the get the logs to the to the water to where they could make rafts. Skid loads of white pine. Uh, here they're getting the wood out a little faster, they're putting it on, they got horses, they're loading onto flat cars and uh, getting the wood to the sawmills lo located along the shore. Here again, uh, they're using oxen here, but you know, the railroad, and here's the little uh, the steam engines that they would use, and that was a very efficient way to get, get, the, um, get the logs out. And here you see a raft at, at Cornucopia, probably headed for the Pike Sawmill. Um, <clears throat> this is Robinson Pike, uh, his, his sawmill operated from 1872 to 1906. Um, and how did they get that? I mean, we used part of the wood, but what did we do with that wood? How would we get, we didn't have a railroad. How do we get that to market? How would we do that? Go by boat, we we'll go through the Sioux, get it down to Chicago, that was the big place, you know. Here you see them loading uh, lumber that was cut at the sawmill. This is another boat at the West Dock. You see all the wood piled up there, ready to be loaded. Uh, here's the Pestigo at the East Dock. And I think you see shingles and lath underneath there and, and lumber there. Uh, off to Tonawanda, Detroit and Buffalo, the, the Henry Baldwin loading pre-1900. Uh, and here you see a load of uh, Hardwoods, this is probably for railroad ties. And the three large mills in Washburn, they, they hired, they had five to 600 mills, people, men employed in the mills. A.A. A. Bigelow was cutting 40 million board feet per year. They made lumber, shingles, and lath. They had a narrow gauge railroad, 11 miles of track, two locomotives, 35 cars, 300 men in the woods, in addition to the five or 600 people working in a sawmill. And not only that, they had their own fleets. There was independent fleets, but they had, Bigelow had its own fleet. They had two steamships, and each steamship had two barges. And these barges were, a lot of times, sailing vessels that had sort of outlived their usefulness. They used them as barges. And they would head normally to Chicago. C.C. C. Thompson, 24 million board feet per year, lumber, lath, and shingles. They owned a fleet. They had a steamship and three barges for that steamship. And then Cook didn't have railroad, didn't have sh steamship. <laughs> they just cut lath and lumber and shingles, 18 million cubic feet per year. So this is, you're coming to an end now. And this is, 
this is, you know, what is the use of all this history? And uh, there, was a, there was a book, a uh, bestseller in 1982, uh, called Blue Highways, and it was written by um, William Least Heat Moon, and he traveled the back roads. These were the, and the roads, and the road maps in those days, the main roads were in red, and the back roads were in blue. And he followed all around the United States. He went to talk to people. He said, his question is, what is American history really about? And he spoke with deeply rooted people off the main path. And he was maybe searching for a path for his own, for his own life. And uh, he, went, he went to New Jersey. And New Jersey is the most heavily, it's the most densely populated state in the Union. But remarkably, about 20% of it is hardly populated at all. So you've got the Pine Barrens there. And, um, and so he spoke with a man who had been there for generations. And this supposedly is a quote, and I don't think anybody really speaks this brilliantly, has this much of a command of the language to speak this way. But here's what he, words to the effect. He said, the man, when he asked him the question, what's history all about? He said, the problem, the guy answered, <clears throat> supposedly word for word, the problem of what we're doing lies in deciding what's the benefit of history and what's the burden. We're not trying to hold back the future, but we do believe what has happened is at least as important as what could happen. The future should grow from the past, not obliter obliterate it. The evidence of history, whether it's archives or architecture, is rare. It's worth preserving. It's relevant. It's useful. Here, it also happens to be beautiful. Maybe I've been influenced by the old Quakers, and there was a big Quaker settlement there, who believed it was a moral question always to consider what you leave behind, and why not? It's not a bad measure of a man or a woman, what they leave behind. And so, you know, we're blessed with a beautiful lake in the islands. They're just gorgeous, and people come from all over to see them. But we used to have forests, too, and I think, you know, my personal opinion is that we should have some brushland rehab. You know, it takes a long, long while to go from brush to nice big white pine. We can speed that up, and I think it would be, the result would be beautiful. I think it would be cost effective, and I think it would be sustainable. It's a very good carbon sink when you have these big trees. There's a lot more carbon in that than an equal amount of brush, you know. Um, so with that, um, that ends my talk, and I'd be glad to try to answer any questions.
an acre, so they bring in $5 million a year, approximately. And it used to be that they would cut our taxes. You know, I don't know what our, what our budget is, eight or 10 million a year, but they, but they, uh, go ahead. I'm on the county board, I'm on the forestry committee. <clears throat> the forestry committee, the forestry department brings in just a hair of $5 million into the general fund a year. Um, we have a sustainable forest. We have a, a forest that we replant, that are jack pine, we replant in Norway, and we've been replanting white pine. Uh, white pine grew by itself. I've been a logger all my life. I logged a lot of second tools of white pine that came up from white pine from the original cut. Uh, and there's, we have a lot of white pine. We probably don't see it right around me, but South of here, there's a lot of white pine in the Drummond area in that country. Uh, everybody thinks the tree has to be big. Well, I went to a meeting one time and the guy says, How come everybody hates baby trees? Good question. <laughs> they can't all be big today, but they will be big. We have a very substantial growth. Norway pines in this country. Not so much up in the northern part, but when you get down to the sand country, there's a lot of Norway pine. I've, I've seen it, I've seen big stands in, in uh, Douglas County, huge, huge stands. You know. It's good to see. You talked about how they replanted in the Pacific Northwest. Yes. So what was the difference? Was it just like more knowledge later? Well, I think he learned by making mistakes, you know. He had to quit logging here because there were two more trees. And so he realized if he was going to have a company, uh, he'd have to have a logging company, he'd have to have some logs. Incidentally, Warehouser, you know, he continued the same way that he was here. He's heavily, Warehouse was heavily invested in, in places like Potlatch and, and Boise Cascade and, and a couple dozen other companies, so they're, he has a lot of political power. And Warehouse, a company I work for, them, they take care of their employees, they really do, and they don't make mistakes with money. Uh, I think it's just uh, built into that company, but they're, um, and I know they've made terrible mistakes. Um, but just as an example, um, during the Depression, uh, I worked for a Northwest Paper Company. They had to change their name from Warehouse because of antitrust laws. But during the Depression, they kept that paper mill going. It was making, it was making, turning uh, scrap wood into, into a product, you know, because the big trees were gone. But they, um, they kept the mill running, not seven days a week, maybe five days a week or four days a week, but everybody in town had a job, employees. They may only get 10 hours a week, 20 hours. How many hours did you get? But they all got a paycheck. And the loyalty of the people in Cloquet to that mill when I first got out of school and I worked for them was unbelievable. It was just they, the company couldn't do anything wrong. You know, they really liked Warehouser. Warehouser made an awful lot of money, you know, and the loggers made a dollar a day. He was making millions, but you know, that's that's our system. Go ahead. Some piece of the discussion about uh, reforestation and, and uh, of design to recover the forest is tied to the thinking in the late 1800s or that we had to get rid of the trees because we're an agrarian society. We got rid of the trees and you're going to farm. The expectation was at that point the trees had value, uh, obviously, for construction, reconstruction after the Civil War and so on. But the, the mindset was that get rid of the trees because you're going to farm. Yes. Okay. And over time, uh, the Industrial Revolution, a lot of other things were at play as we evolved and as logging moved west to effect some of that change. Yes. Uh, you know, a lot of that land that they expected to be farmland went, went to farms and went tax the land. You know, and ultimately had, we had to adopt to that and go in a different direction. Yeah. The gentleman here deals with the Bayfield County Board. The counties now are the largest public landowner in the state. Two and a half million acres of the most productive land driven and decision making made by people locally who understand 
uh, resource for you. Yeah, I, I, I totally, I think, I think Bayfield County is just doing a wonderful job. Um, getting, back, getting back to the thing, you know, they cleared a lot of land and they were farming. Well, the marginal farms that did not make it farming got planted back to trees or else the forest that didn't sell back to trees. So I came back to a forest by itself or it got to the plant. Especially in the WPA days when they run uh, the CST camps and stuff. They, they, they planted all that old marginal farm, farm land into it. It's beautiful. It's beautiful, beautiful what they're doing. Um, my opinion is there's a lot of private um, forest land is not being taken care of like it should be. I would like to see more intensive forestry there, especially rehabbing uh, brushland. I think, you know, it's like we've wiped out the landscape. It was like right after the glacier, now we have to go through all these series of different plants. The climax forest is like the white pine. Why not plant them directly? You know, that's my opinion. I got a question. Sure. Whose land was logged in this great pine cut over? Who owned the land and what were the stoppages involved? Oh man. Uh, <laughs> have you ever heard of the Traveling 40? I mean, after the Civil War, um, the veterans, a lot of veterans were city guys and they were given uh, some kind of script that they could locate 40 acres any place they wanted in government land. <laughs> well, guys like uh, big landowners like maybe a warehouse, or they would go into the bars in Chicago buy them a drink and say, give me, your, give me your thing. And they would get those things. And a lot of times they used the same one over and over and over again until they were, you know, somebody say, well, where's your doc, where's your deed? And they say, well, here it is. Um, but yeah, a lot of it was, uh, uh, a lot of the land was, was got by these land bearers. And uh, a lot of it was from, like, for example, veterans, Civil War veterans. A lot of, uh, prior to that too, I think it was about 1872, they came up. Access. Yes, yes. So everybody in America, boy, if you had you a little pile of land, all you had to do to prove Buffalo is just build a house and put a whiskey bottle and put a window in there. And I think a lot of northern Wisconsin were part of those homestead. Oh, sure, oh, sure. Well, our land up into the macro railroad track, uh, west of Pike Street here, just two, three, three and a half miles west of here. Uh, well, that's County Forest land now, and it did become County Coming land afterwards was a federal land, and they got they got land the stuff from the feds, or was it all you know? Does anyone know? The Kelly and Tom, I think, was all pretty much homestead and independent buyers. Then about 1930, right. some of the big boys weren't paying taxes anymore on their properties. They cut the timber, they left, they left town, they left the railroads, left everybody who had land up here left, and all of a sudden there's no tax base up here. That type of thing, and so the National Forest Service came to Bayfield County, I think 1930 or 32, somewhere in there, and they picked up all this land that was just left. You know, people vacated, and then they took over the National Forest at that point in time. Tom Forest probably did some of the same things too. So you're, so, you're thinking that one way or another, uh, the land was uh, held in some kind of deed by the logging companies rather than. Some of it was, yeah. No, I mean, some of it were just regular guys that foreclosed to you know, things like that. So I think it's a combination of everybody. But the railroads, they, big, they didn't pay their fair shares either. They got really good deals from Bayfield County, putting those little railroads in like that, and investing all that money, like six hundred thousand dollars in one year, putting those spike railroads in, and all of a sudden Bayfield Western and Railway Company, wherever it was. Abandons and says we can't make any money here. We think we're going to be able to pay you guys back. So the county has made some errors in the past. You got to remember one thing: the the timber that was cut here built the rest of the United States. In other words, the Dakotas, one down in Indiana, Illinois, all in farms and all in cities built from timber. Yeah. It wasn't. It wasn't cut and burnt up. It was used. We still yeah. have many buildings. Yeah. Yeah. John Cano built the first mill in Bayfield in 1856 and burned down. 1857, he had another one. All that all that machinery is shipped up on the Lady Elgin 
And that when they built Beto, Wisconsin, it wasn't to get the timber here. It wasn't because it would be a nice tourist town. You know, uh, you know that the first thing that got off the boat was a mill and then probably a, a, you know, a few people to work it. Okay, well, um, yes. How big is the timber industry in Wisconsin today? What percentage of the economy is this Well, a few years ago, um, the paper industry employed 50,000 people. Today, it's 30,000. And what they've gotten rid of is, uh, this is just the paper industry. Uh, what they've gotten rid of is the uh, small, inefficient mills. And so, what's left is a big, modern, high-speed mills. And so that's going to come back to but as far as modern here, I can't It's a good question, though. A lot better than the answer you got. Can I change the mood of the audience a little bit? Sure. How many of you know about Moose Turd Pie? <coughs> Moose Turd Pie. I married into a Norwegian family. I was a lady until I married into them. And I learned two kind of off-color jokes. And so wherever I am, I can tell those two. And my father-in-law, Gil Larson, would actually laugh. Um, but anyhow, Grandpa Oscar, Oscar Hare, worked in the lumber mills. He did cut his hand on one of the big saws, so he became an accountant and a counter and did the paper. And because of that, he was often called upon to cook when in the lumber mills. That was kind of the worst job, because if you didn't cook very well, everybody griped and complained, and you were still cooking. So they got, they, the cooks wanted to quit, and they decided, no, you would cook until somebody complained about your cooking. And if somebody complained, then they would have to cook. So now you know the story of most turd pie? Yeah, well, anyhow, is there, should I go on? It's a good story. So Grandpa Oscar had been cooking quite a few weeks, and he decided he just had to get rid of this job. So he went out and got some moose turds. Now you hunters know that moose turds look like brown marshmallows, right? They're kind of soft and gooey. And he whipped up some really flaky pie crusts. <laughs> and he put those moose turds in that pie and baked them. And he could hardly wait until the crew had dessert. He was going to give up his cooking job. So the first person to take a bite hesitated and said, Tastes like shit, but sure am good. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's a good story. <laughs> <laughs> You're cooking the drinks for everybody here. <laughs>